So Dr. Ogden, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. It's great to be here. We're discussing a very fascinating subject, something that is very alien to the modern person, but was a more commonplace in antiquity than we'd like to think, right? So of course, we're discussing necromancy in the Greco-Roman antique world. It's important to define this term first, however. So I didn't know if you could define what necromatea is for the audience, and how is this term understood in antiquity? Well, necromantea is made of two very simple elements in Greek terms. The second element, mantea, means divination or prophecy. And if we find it in a number of maybe slightly obscure English words, like a neuromancy, divination from dreams, uh, cladonomancy, divination from random noises, <laughs> teromancy, divination from shaking lots. So mancy is divination. And then necro, which it can also be expressed as necro, and maybe that version of the element will be more familiar to your listeners, means dead things with, with death or being dead. And so we, we obviously we find that in some familiar English words like necropolis and, of course, necrophilia. So necromantea or necromantea is simply divination from dead people. And that ultimately gives us our English word necromancy. And it's important to say here, though, that the word necromancy in English has sort of expanded, morphed in the history of English. In the medieval period, in particular, it was the first element, necro, was confused with a Latin term meaning black. And so the word was sort of reclassified to mean black magic. Okay. It's important to note when we're talking about necromancy in the ancient world, that it means specifically divination from the dead. It doesn't mean black magic or bad magic or anything like that. Although you may well think that some of the examples of necromancy practiced in the ancient world were indeed bad magic. It seems to be a fixture of antiquity as far back, probably even predating Homer, right? You see Homer talking about this very elaborate dark technology in book 10 and 11 of the Odyssey. Circe, the witch, is providing Odysseus the dark technology of magic, instructions on how to evoke the dead prophet Tiresias. Goes through this really elaborate ritual. Like you said in the book, and offerings that he's giving are virtually indistinguishable from paying tribute at the cult, at the tombs and the hero cult shrines, right? But he's also doing some really strange stuff like sacrificing the black heifer and burning it whole, calling upon the spirits. What were some of the reasons for invoking the souls of the dead? Some of us are very familiar with Odysseus's reasons, but what were some other reasons practically for invoking and divining from the souls of the dead. Just to say something about Circe and the Odyssey first. So I don't know what date you want to put on Homer. I mean, 700 BC would be a traditional date, but obviously it is a deeply traditional text. And as it happens, book 11, the so-called Nequia book of the Odyssey, is regarded as having some of the oldest language in Homer. One can date the language of Homer according to metrical criteria. So who knows how old that particular narrative of this necromantic consultation is. It could be very ancient indeed. It's something that stands right at the head of the Greek literary tradition, as far as we're concerned. Now, in terms of the reasons, well, I mean, Odysseus is just asking the way home, which seems a bit banal in some ways, and other requests to ghosts can be banal. One thing, for example, that they can be asked to find is lost treasure. Again, there's a sort of folk tale narrative that pops up more than once in the ancient world relating to ghosts being asked to do that. Now, it's not that the ghosts have any special knowledge of where treasure is or can sort of look underneath the ground uh, where they have themselves for it. As far as the, that tale is concerned, it's just that they happen to have buried it themselves when they were alive and died without telling anybody where it was. And so the ghost has to be called up. So all the special knowledge that the ghost is being asked for in those circumstances is just what they knew as a living person. Possibly the most common reason, it's hard to say, the most common reason for calling up a ghost and wanting to talk to it is actually to lay it. So paradoxically, you're calling up the ghost to lay it down again, to keep it quiet. That's because you've been harassed by it, you know, have a restless ghost. And the, the obvious story to talk about here is the story of Pausanias the regent, the guy who drove the Persians out of Greece in, in 479. After he'd done that, he was leading the forward advance against the Persians at Byzantium. And he be became a bit full of himself, a bit tyrannical. 
and he conceived a desire for a local Byzantine girl called Cleonice. That's probably speaking, means fair victory, so probably a speaking name in Persenius's case. He had her brought to his bed in the night, but he was asleep when she arrived, and as she sort of fumbled towards his bed and knocked over a lampstand, he thought, oh my God, assassins have come to kill me, and he lashed out with the sword he kept under his pillow and killed her. Uh, and after that, he was harassed by her ghost. And so he went to an oracle of the dead to call up the ghost, to ask the ghost, what do I need to do to square this deal? What do I need to do to settle you, to get you to leave me alone? So again, it's paradoxical. You know, the guy's having too much of the ghost. Why would he call it up? Well, clearly, ghosts can attack people in a way in which they can't be reasoned with. It's just a, you know, a terror, an infliction of terror. If you want a rational conversation with a ghost, then you have to do it under controlled circumstances. So that seems to have been a thing. You know, So you ask the ghost, what do I need to do to lay you, to give you rest, to give you peace? And as it happens in, in that particular case, just to finish the story, Cleonice tells Pausanias, well, just go back to Sparta, go back to your home city of Sparta. But what she knew and he didn't is that he was destined to be killed pretty much as soon as he got back home. So, in fact, that was the ghost's revenge. So, placation would be one thing. Then in literary texts especially, we do have the notion that necromancy is the ultimate form of divination, the most powerful form of divination, the surest form. So, on that basis, again, that's the famous episode in Lucan's Pharsalia. We have Lucan telling us about this Thessalian witch who reanimates her dead body the very interesting form of necromancy. He reanimates a dead body for Sextus Pompey, the son of Pompey the Great, in order to get a prediction of which way the civil war that Pompey and Caesar are currently engaged in is going to go, who's going to win. And Rick, though the witch who's managing this operation for Sextus Pompey, makes it clear that this is the most powerful, the most secure form of divination. And otherwise, you might want to ask the dead about something that they would know in particular, which is the nature of the afterlife or sort of expanding that a bit, the nature of the universe, what's important about life and death, this sort of thing. So that's a theme that comes out, for example, in oh, it's a satirical text in Lucian's Manippus. So, you know, eschatology, what goes on after we die, this sort of thing. And obviously the, the, you know, the, the dead are going to know that. But that's a sort of tour, I guess, of the, the most prominent reasons for calling up a dead person and trying to speak to them. You point out in your book that sometimes the dead aren't even really prone to special knowledge and there's no real uniform way of calling them up, even getting back to Homer and the Odyssey. Certain ghosts seem to need the libation of the blood from the sacrifice to mm. even have a coherent kind of conversation, but others like Tiresias and then later one of his fallen soldiers don't even need the blood, so it's it's very inconsistent. And yeah, just getting to Lucan and Erecto, the the Salian witch, it gets very evil dead in a way <laughs> with these reanimation of corpses. And we'll get to that later in all the myriad of ways to call up these uh, spirits. You point out in your book that there were important places for these oracles of the dead. Why were liminal spaces like battlefields and tombs so important for this? Well, I think... I think tombs are, are almost self-explanatory. You know, that's where the dead person is. And battlefields, because battlefields were massive repositories of restless dead. So a thing we haven't really touched upon yet is restlessness. So in general terms, one particular category of dead person that you might want to exploit for magical purposes is the restless dead. So these are people that, again, haven't, dead that haven't achieved full peace yet, and so they're more available they're more mobile, you know, they're still partly engaged in the world of the living. And it's usually said that there are four categories of these. These categories overlap. So there are people that haven't been buried, which is to say haven't received due rights of burial. It could be that they've just been shoved into the ground, you know, murder victim, just hidden. But that's not the due right of burial. So unburied people, people that have died before their time. So again, there's a notion that you may have to sort of live out your supposed lifespan, as it were, between this place and the other place, whatever the other place is, before you're allowed rest. Then there's people that have died by violence and people that have died unmarried. And an unmarried female ghosts in particular are supposed to be quite vigorous because apparently female, uh, again, the, the cultural expectation is that women above all wanted to be married. And a woman who dies unmarried is particularly frustrated and therefore uh, like to bruise a particularly sort of angry or active, vigorous, restless ghost. So battlefields are particularly valuable as repositories of loads of ghosts who are dead by violence, by definition, 
and probably most of them effectively unburied. Again, there might have been some sort of hasty attempt to put them into a tumulus or something, but very often, you know, the dead people are just, as with the World War One battlefields, the dead people are just lying there in the ground, you know. And incidentally, it's just an, uh, an aside here, the Marathon battlefield was supposed to be full of particularly vigorous ghosts, and we're told that a stranger who happened to be walking past the battlefield or through the battlefield at night would hear the sounds of the battle going on, and even the sounds of the horses, which interestingly implies that there were animal ghosts, were told that uh, if you just sort of happened innocently by, the ghosts would leave you alone. But if you actually went there looking for them, then they would give you trouble. So that expresses the idea you know, that the battlefields were sort of ghost-intensive places. All these examples of farmers getting the brunt of these hauntings, you know, must have been terrifying. How much of it was literary and how much of it was truthful, we obviously can't say. So in your book, you point out that obviously the battlefields and the tombs are important places, but there were also other oracle places, if you will, near lakesides, near tombs. You point out four in particular. So what are the big four Necuomantea? Nec we've, we've used the word Necuomantea so far in its abstract sense, to mean necromancy in general, but there's also a related term, Necromanteon, which means oracle of the dead, so place of necromancy. Now, confusingly, it's plural. Necromantea is the same as the abstract term we've just been talking about. And if you look at the applications of that word, and words which clearly have the same meaning, same function, like Sukamanteon, which is basically, you know, a prophecy place of souls, or Sukapompeion, which is sending up place of souls, because these words are actually all used interchangeably in the ancient texts. And if you look at their application, it becomes clear that there are basically four places to which these are applied. We can't really prove they were applied to any places other than these four sites, and, that, and that's why I call them the big four. So these were a site on the Acheron River in Thesprosia in northern Greece, very much the, the, the top end of Greece. And Homer's description of Odysseus's consultation, shall we say, aligns in its topography with that site. And I'm speaking rather de deliberately vaguely there. You could say that Homer already knows about the oracle and is incorporating it into his epic. Or you could say that the idea of the oracle was extrapolated from <laughs> Homer's epic. It's, it's not clear exactly what's going on, but there's a, clearly an alignment there. The next most famous one is Lake of Vernus in Campania in Italy, the famous big round volcanic lake surrounded by fumaroles. So that's pretty atmospheric in every sense. And then the lesser known ones, perhaps Heraclea Pontica, which is on the south coast of the Black Sea, so northern Turkey, modern Eregli. That seems to have been associated with a cave of some sort. And then the furthest point south of the Greek mainland, the Tyneron, the tip of the, the Marni Peninsula. And again, sources are vague and contradictory, but there is talk of a cave of some sort there. So those seem to be four special places where you could go, as I were to call it, but goes on your own terms, it seems, in tradition at any rate. Going through your book, looking at the reconstruction scholars do of such places, the picture almost tends to border on a kind of parody. You imagine like priests in this dark cave in the crevices manipulating dummies and statues, a kind of Black Bart's cave funhouse. I don't know if you're familiar with Denver, Colorado at all, but there's this place called Casa Bonita that yeah. has these kind of things. It's this kind of Casa Bonita deal. But as you point out in your book, why is the reality of such places much more simple and sparse, especially based on lack of epigraphical evidence? Well, th these places were never adopted by states and made into formal sanctuaries. The reason I hesitated is because Tynerum Cave was within the hinterland, at least, of the Poseidon Temple on the Cape there, and clearly did seem to have some sort of association with it. So again, it's hard to say what sort of association. So these places were never adopted by states. It's unlikely that they were ever formal or official in any sense. It is quite striking that there's no epigraphy associated with them, because as you probably know, as a, when you're interested in, in ancient religion, you know, the, the Greeks couldn't stop putting up inscription for everything, really. So it's, it is significant that no inscriptions are associated with these places. I suppose not much was needed, really. All you needed was a place which seemed to be in contact, somehow linked 
to the underworld, either through a lake or through a cave. And you needed a means of experiencing the ghost at them, which in the end was basically yourself. So, you know, what else was needed, really? Yeah, I mean, just to flesh out some of the stuff you were saying there, I'm pretty sure, you know, having scrutinised all the literary evidence, and that's all we have. Again, we don't really have any archaeological evidence. The Oracle of the Dead on the River Acheron was simply a lakeside precinct. Maybe even the word precinct is too formal. The side of a lake, or maybe a rock drifting out over the, the Acherusian Lake. The, the Acheron River flooded out into some sort of marshy lake, which is what our sources focus on. It's as simple as that. But that's not good for tourism. And I have to say, I do think that the Greek Archaeological Service is not as dissociated from the Greek Tourist Service as it should be, or at least their interests aren't sufficiently differentiated. And so back from, I think, from the 50s, he started work on it. We have Soterios Dakaris excavating what is clearly basically a farmhouse with an interesting cellar or possibly a system underneath it which is a nice sort of cave with a vault, a cave-like structure with a vault, and declaring, sorry, this is this is a, a tafira, so, you know, beside the Acheron, and declaring that this was the Acheron Necromanteon. And, you know, you can go there today and buy a booklet, you know, and look around the place and it'll, it'll t- explain how this was the Oracle of the Dead and then we'll go a little tour around it and look at the places where you were fed drugs to help you hallucinate. Yeah, the, the beans, right? The hallucinogenic yeah. beans. <laughs> Exactly. And they'll show you bits of a machine, which was a ghost machine, a machine for wheeling out ghosts. In fact, they're just bits of catapult on catapults because the place was destroyed in a siege by the Romans. It's, it's, it's fascinating that there's this desire to, to understand ancient necromancy in terms of a sort of Disneyland experience, you know, which clearly wouldn't have made any sense at all to the ancients themselves. Yeah, I mean, you basically, you went to sleep and you saw the ghost in your sleep. <laughs> it's as simple as that, really. Uh, it's very interesting. People nowadays tend to sensationalize it almost like a theme park experience. Oh. I think it's uh, the romanticization people do nowadays. They tend to put these dark aspects onto things like the mysteries and to dream divination and to necromancy. Obviously, there were aspects that were dark about it, but these people are asking sometimes very basic, but also very existential questions that aren't necessarily conducive to this edgy satanic theme park that people tend to think of it nowadays. So let's talk about perhaps the most important aspects of necromancy besides skull necromancy. Could you discuss incubation? You just touched upon, you know, going to sleep and that's what basically happened. But people would go to these places, especially the tombs of the dead, and in a sense, go to sleep, right? So what is incubation? It should be said that the practice of incubation is broader than necromancy specifically. In fact, it's most familiar in connection with the cult of Asclepius and similar healing gods, where you would spend the night in their temple or in a special sleeping house, a quemeterion, which I think gives us the word cemetery, <laughs> a special sleeping house, adjacent to the temple, and there the god would visit you in a dream and either cure you directly or tell you what you needed to do to be cured. So that was quite a big deal, and to a certain extent, taken over by Christian healing shrines as well later on. But because of all our evidence for necromancy, almost all of it is, shall we say, of a sort of fantastical sort, our stories, our narratives will say, you know, so-and-so went to such an oracle of the dead, and they call up the ghost, and they said, they have this conversation. You know, and you want to say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> but what do you mean by calling up a ghost? I mean, how did you actually experience the ghost? And the only source to discuss this in any sort of realistic way is Plutarch, who tells the story of Elysius of Torino. He doesn't actually specify which oracle of the dead he's talking about, but probably it's Avernus. And he says, and basically, the chap wanted to know why his son had died. So he went along to the Necromante and the Oracle of the Dead. He made the customary sacrifices, not explained, it's all quite brief. And then he went to sleep, and then he experienced a visit from the ghost, both of his son and of his father, in fact. He's told that um, it was best for his son that he should have died when he did, which you might think is a pretty unexciting, <laughs> bland answer. But I think the point being made is a bit like the story of Clevis and Byton, if you know that. They were killed at their best time, and had they lived on, they would have disgraced themselves. So basically, this lad was killed at a time before he went off the rails and went to the bar. You know, that's Plutarch's Plutarch story. So that's the only sort of text we have that attempts to 
describe a necromantern experience in realistic terms. So we have to run with that. That's the best we've got, I think. But of course, incubation, or I should say sleeping more generally, is a common way of experiencing ghosts spontaneously. That's a very common notion in ancient literature. Starting again with Homer, the famous dream of of Achilles. There he's sort of keeping Patroclus unburied because he wants to make the most elaborate funeral possible. But Patroclus, now dead, doesn't care about any of the sort of honour that is important in the living world. All he cares about is being given peace. And he says, you know, get me buried quickly. I don't care how you do it, just do it so that I can join the ghost on the other side of the river. Again, there's a river of some sort which separates the living and the dead. And he can't be at peace until he can cross that river and join the other dead. Uh, I mean, it's a very common notion uh, that ghosts visit people in their sleep in the ancient world. Consulting a ghost as an oracle of the dead is presumably just a slightly more controlled way of of interacting with with the ghost. You know, you speak to the ghost on your terms rather than on their terms, I suppose. What is skull necromancy? Because you mentioned that the later literary depictions of reanimation of corpses um, seems to give a nod to skull necromancy. If you just touch upon skull necromancy. I mean, in many ways, the most exciting literary you have to say, fantastical descriptions of necromancy, focus on not merely calling up a ghost, but reanimating a dead body. You know, again, in, in Lucan's episode, the witcher Rigtho calls up a ghost and then inserts it into the body <laughs> in order to reanimate it. So but obviously, obviously, this is great stuff. I mean, you can imagine this making great movies, these reanimation sequences. And again, you know, you read these things and you, you enjoy them and you say, yes, but what? Can this possibly have related to anything that actually happened? You know, I mean, given we assume that one, even the most powerful agent, which could not, in fact, reanimate a dead body. You know, so you ask yourself, what is going on? What is there a reality behind this fantasy? And the nearest that I can come to a reality which is relevant to that is what you've said, skull necromancy. And we know about this really from the Green Magical Papyri. So there's a spell... Now, the Green Magical Papyri, I should say, and they're very curious and difficult things to work with. They're late antique for the most part, 4th, 5th century AD, written in Egypt. They're written in Greek, or they're also papyri written in Demotic Egyptian, sometimes both. And they reflect not only Greek culture and Egyptian culture, but also Jewish culture. So they're a real blend, a real mishmash. It's often very difficult to know how to relate these two, earlier Greek culture. But we do have one text, the copy we have is 4th century, the contents are thought to be 2nd century AD. So we're getting a bit further back with that. And these contain a recipe for basically calling a dead man who can either sort of act as your sort of servant, your familiar, or again, you know, tell you stuff, necromancy. And basically, you, so you take a skull and you perform rites on it, and we're told the dead man is going to appear to you in your sleep. So again, the incubation or kind of incubation is, is going on again there. That, again, that is how you encounter your dead person. Yeah, so we, we assume that the skull that you operate on is the skull of the person that's going to appear to you. That is meaningful, as it were, <laughs> just about, according to our way of understanding things. You know, you can sort of just about, yeah, I could I, just about think, yeah, I could get a skull. I could perform those rites on the skull. And I could go to sleep and hopefully get a relevant dream out of it. So since you are actually manipulating a, a sort of bit of corpse, you know, to get your necromancy, that seems to be the sort of the nearest, I think, to the sort of full body reanimations that we get in the literary tradition. So I think that's probably what lies behind them. There are sort of other intimations of necromancy involving just sort of decapitated heads. So there's this wonderful story of Cleomenes, Cleomenes the first, supposedly mad Cleomenes, king of Sparta. Lots of great stories about him and Herodotus. One of the things he did, apparently, he had a, a good friend when he was still crown prince called Arconides and he promised Arconides that when he became king he would share all his counsels with him you know he would you know ask his advice and everything almost I guess always going to share his rule with him when he did become king he changed his mind so he cut off Arconides' head and then kept it pickled in a pot of honey but he was true to his promise and always discussed his plans with his head and I think probably lurking behind that is the notion that he was somehow getting some sort of reply back somehow or other from this decapitated head. And then we have this very vestigial tradition of the head of Orpheus. Now, Orpheus was torn apart by the Thracian women and, the, and his bits were thrown into the sea, but his head 
uh, we're told, washed up on Lesbos and then took up residence in a nook in a cranny. So, which is a curious phrase, in a nook in a cranny. And there is one brilliant, brilliant pot, um, a classical, classical pot, red figure pot, which shows a man climbing down a shaft. He's got his hand on a rope that he's, he's climbed down. And at the bottom of this shaft, and again, there's a nook within further sort of niche within the floor of the shaft, and in there is sitting an office's head, and he's reaching out to it, so he's clearly you know having a conversation with office's head, and that is exactly it. I suppose that's the within you know in a nook in a cranny in in a in a little hole in a bigger hole. So that's skull necromancy, decapitated head necromancy, for you. I almost imagine Orpheus's head functioning akin to the serpent Glycon, and how they did that whole deal with. The- Maybe they had somebody in the back, like with a. Well, it's, it's, it's so hard to say because all we have is the pot and a bit of philostratus. I think it is, you know, I mean, a sentence and a half, and that's it, really. So it's very difficult to know what was going on there. All this stuff is so colorful. And, and I second your call for Hollywood to make these into feature films. I always said that Achilles Tatius's Leucope and Clytophon should be made into some kind of big budget feature. And they should do like Apuleius's golden ass for sure. But let's make the uh, antiquity cinematic universe happen, everybody. We've touched upon Skull Necromancy. And since you mentioned the, the PGM or Greek Magical Papyri, I, I figured I'd just touch upon those. We find many necromancy rituals, as you pointed out, in the PGM. And this is something we perhaps haven't touched upon as much, but of course it intersects with cursed tablets and the like. Uh, another reason for necromancy often was also to the spells for binding. They would have the spirit carry these out. Is that correct? Uh, well, yes. But again, I would I'd go back to my sort of my pious definition at the beginning of the show that is something that you could manipulate ghosts to do in the ancient world but that isn't necromancy there's this tradition of binding magic which certainly is up and running by 500 bc and doesn't really ever finish maybe peters out a bit in very late late antiquity and so these are cursed tablets and there are various ways in which these work and sometimes one is using the gods in them or typically underworld gods sometimes Perhaps the tablets were thought to be just powerful in themselves. But very often these tablets are invoking ghosts to do the, the act of binding for them. And they, they could be placed in graves, even in actually in the right hands of corpses to enact. And these are binding curses. They're not just general curses. They are specifically binding curses. And they tend to specialise in particular areas. So the earliest ones are actually specialised in legal curses in binding the tongues of lawyers and things like that then we get competition curses where you're binding rivals in sport or in core competitions in the roman empire you get some great curses binding charioteers and and indeed the horses in the circuses and you also get erotic binding curses where initially you're binding the attractiveness of again restraining the attractiveness of a rival lover actual or imaginary in order to, to get the girl you want or the boy you want. The erotic cur- curses do sort of morph in interesting ways, actually. That's another major use of the dead in the ancient world. But it's only necromantic in the modern expanded sense of the word necromancy, not in terms of the ancient concept. Yeah. I mean, necromancy is associated with sort of all types, really. You know, your standard witches and wizards get the necromantic associations. But perhaps the one specialist that's, that's worth singling out in particular is the Sukagogos. His sole trade, as it were, was necromancy. Uh, Sukagogos means soul drawer, soul caller up, I suppose. And again, shadowy, dark, to use your word, figures. And perhaps our best glimpse of them is in a fragment of Aeschylus. And this is, this is where Aeschylus is retelling the story of Odysseus' consultation of the dead. And in this tragedy, the chorus was made up of Sukagogoi, his spirit drawers these callers up of ghosts and one of the fragments has them advising Odysseus on how to talk to the dead and he says stand by this dirty murky lake again here's my evidence for the acro necromante and see this, this sort of configuration and you know cut your sacrifice's throat pour the blood into the water and the ghosts the night wandering ghosts will rise up out of the water to speak to you. It's only a short fragment, but very, very atmospheric, very compelling. And Sugagogoi seem like very intriguing and mysterious people on that basis. 
So there they're associated seemingly with an oracle of the dead site. At other times, they seem to be more mobile. So, for example, when the Spartans were having trouble, when they were being harried by the ghost of Pausanias, the guy I mentioned before, the regent, after the Spartans had killed him, then his ghost in turn became angry and started harassing the Spartans, and they had to call in Sukagogoi, again, these, these ghost-manipulating specialists, in order to lay his ghost, get some peace there. And we sort of get a parody of a Sukagogos in Aristophanes' Birds, where we have Socrates calling up the ghost of Chirophon. It's a complicated joke, which we can't, can't really go into fully, I think, here. But part of the joke there is that Socrates, as a sort of self-denying, otherworldly figure, looks a sort of ghostly and corpse-like, as the ghost he himself is calling up. You know, It's probably better in the original. <laughs> But funnier in the original than the way I tell it. So Suga Gogo, I think, I mean, they're, they're evanescent. They're really hard to get a hold of. But I say they are the specialists of specialists when necromancy is concerned. One of the reasons it's hard to get hold of them is because they are sort of confined to the world of literary source. Although there is actually um, a tablet from Dodona, the Oracle of Zeus there, which was actually quite close to the Acro Necromante, which famously says, shall we employ Dorios the Suga Gogos? So... They clearly did exist in the real world. They weren't pure fantasy. And there was somebody actively contemplating using them. Now, whether Dorios the Sugagogos was based at the other local oracle, who knows? Who knows? He may have been. I'd like to hope that they existed in real life, just, just how colorful mm. those characters would be. So we've touched upon it, the whole show, the stereotypes of the Sukagoge. We see a couple of stereotypes in particular. I wanted to touch upon the orientalizing, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term, stereotypes that and Greek and Roman antiquity had about these people. And also something that's not just in regard to Sukagoge, but also witchcraft in general with the Salian witches. They always seem to be um, from this area of the world. So I didn't know if you could touch upon that. This isn't specific to necromancy. This is just sort of ancient magic in general. Not many people would, would agree with me, but the way I see the story going is this. Um, the ancients, way back in the archaic period and long before that, had a very clear idea of magic. We weren't using the word magic, but they had a very clear, clear idea of something that we can call magic, or witchcraft. And this was basically one grounded in folklore, and in international folklore in general. Is full of witches, witches especially, also wizards to a certain extent. And there's, you know, every reason to suppose that the roots of international folklore are much older than classical antiquity. We've talked about the Odyssey as one well as, you know, the earliest or the second earliest text that the ancient world bequeaths to us. And there we have a full blown, fully grown witch in Circe, displaying a whole range of powers which actually align very closely with the range of powers that from the beginning of the 5th century BC onwards, the Greeks are going to associate with people that they started to call magoi, or you know, magos, mage. Now that word, uh, magos, is derived from Persian, magush. The Greeks can't have been using it much before about 500 BC. They wouldn't have been sufficiently in contact with the Persians for more than half a century before that. What is a magush as far as the Persians were concerned? Well, it seems that, as you'll be familiar with the Persians and the Medes, the Medes were, in fact, you know, originally a separate race, a separate people. And it does seem that the magush was actually a priest in the Median religion. So as far as the Persians were concerned, already a magush was a sort of religious but sort of weird, you know. And possibly that idea is then bought into by the Greeks. There is this male practitioner who does things just like witches do, our ancient folkloric concept of the witch. So it's a bit like religion, but it's also weird. So they, that's how they, they're importing this Persian word. I think what's significant of this sort of 500 BC or thereabout point is that the Greeks are now deciding that men should be associated with this concept as well as women. So I think that's the story of the origin of the word, magos in Greek, mage. Yeah, I mean, one could come out with all the commonplaces about the other, you know, about uh, magic not being quite right and therefore something you associate with peoples other than Greeks. Well, maybe I tend to think that all this otherism is a bit tautological, really. Yeah, so it gets associated with Persians, it gets associated with Chaldeans, who are 
well, in the Greek imagination, a sort of special tribe that lives around Babylon. It gets associated with the Egyptians as well. But actually, the association of Egyptians with magic or witchcraft may be very ancient again for the Greeks, because already in the Odyssey, to go back to that text once more, we have Helen in Book 4 bringing back with her from Egypt two sets of drugs, one which is harmful, one which is healing. Uh, these look very much like magical drugs, and she was given them by the wife of the pharaoh Thonis. So again, we're still in the female realm at that point, but already at that point, we're looking to the Near East for a meaningful association, as it were. The attitude of Greeks and Romans in antiquity towards necromancy is, to say the least, ambiguous. It reaches its culmination in one of my favorites, uh, Lucian, and his writings mm. about Menippus. Obviously, you have figures like Meroe and um, Apuleius, Erecto. Oh. We've touched upon quite a bit. However, even earlier, it was a fixture of tragedy. You touched upon um, Aeschylus um, and things like the Persians. But also, interestingly, it was parodied quite a bit. And you just oh. touched upon Aristophanes' birds. People like Lucian and Aristophanes, I almost see them as like the South Park of their day. They're very much in touch with the social currents. So what was it about necromancy that made it so susceptible to parody? Was it that widespread in antiquity? Well, we have no data of the sort to tell us how widespread it was. We can say that the you know because of the huge impact it's made on the classical literature that survives, we can say that the idea of necromancy, at any rate, was all pervasive. But in terms of back of practice, you know, there's no way to make that jump. You know, we, there's nothing that can give us statistics. Why was it so parodied? Well, the potential is just there, isn't it? You know, one can't really say that there was one moral judgment about necromancy in the ancient world. You know, good guys like uh, Atticius do it, ostensibly bad guys like Erykto do it. Uh, really, I think it's, it seems to be as good as, or bad as the person practicing it very often. The one thing that people tend to have in common when they're doing it is that they're desperate. So I suppose that sort of you know, <laughs> gives you an opportunity for humor, doesn't it? But again, I'm, I'm just trying to think about our own world. I mean, I suppose the nearest equivalent to a, a, a super gogos in our own world would be the medium, you know, some, you know the Victorian style medium, getting around the table and holding hands and saying, you know, are you there, whatever. I think if I think of that cultural trope, I think I know that more from parody than from actuality. <laughs> there is just something inherently funny about it, isn't there? Can I just commend Lucian to your listeners? The Menippus is a text in which Menippus is taken down into the underworld to, to consult the ghost of Tiresias, just as Odysseus had done before him. A very interesting, amusing text for, for all sorts of reasons. But one of the interesting things about that is that he goes down at Babylon. Again, we're talking about Chaldeans. He goes down to Babylon, taken down by this exotic wizard Mithrabarzanes. He spends one day in the underworld, one day traveling through the underworld, talks to Tiresias, and then comes out again through the whole of Trophonius in Lebedire and Boeotia in central Greece. Now, we're talking about something like three months' traveling time between Babylon and Boeotia, but it takes him just one day in the underworld. So, what's going on there? You know, how does underworld time space relate to surface world time space? And also, whilst we're on Lucian, let me also commend my favourite Lucian text of all, which is for the Philip Sudi, you saw The Love of Life, yeah. <laughs> um, which is a collection of 10 amazing, wonderful, both thrilling and funny stories, mainly about wizards of various kinds. That's actually the home of the story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice. It didn't begin with Disney, it didn't begin with Goethe. <laughs> it, it began with Lucian. If your listeners are looking for sort of ancient texts to sort of help them get into the world of ancient magic. No better starting place than Lucian's Philip Sudis. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogden. I cannot stress enough how much of an honor and how awesome this has been. 